It is our aspiration in this resolution simply to say that critical race theory and intersectionality are simply analytical tools that are meant to be used as tools, not as a worldview. So what I'd say with respect to critical race theory is, uh, though yes, all truth is God's truth, well, critical race theory is not true. And with respect to plundering the Egyptians, there's really nothing here worth plundering. To the extent that critical race theory could be considered gold at all, it would have to be called fool's gold. Finally, we come to the um, item that is uh, undoubtedly the most important, and that is uh, the famous or infamous Resolution 9 from the most recent meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention. I assume that most of you have at least heard about it, and so that you know that, uh, if nothing else, uh, it says something about critical race theory that has proven to be highly uh, controversial. Um, I don't want to say too much about this, but I think it's important to understand something of the background of this resolution. As it was originally drawn up and delivered to the resolutions committee, it contained a pretty thoroughgoing condemnation of critical race theory uh, in no uncertain terms, like a comprehensive, if you will, uh, condemnation. But once the resolution reached the resolutions committee, the committee altered it in certain ways so that it was not only in some ways condemnatory or at least cautionary about critical race uh, theory, but also acknowledged some supposed uh, usefulness or good that can come from uh, critical race theory. On the floor of the convention, uh, certain parties who were sympathetic to the viewpoint of the original author of the resolution offered some amendments uh, such as that critical race theory is ultimately generated from the godless atheistic theory of Marxism. Uh, these amendments were rejected by the uh, Resolutions Committee as being hostile amendments. So, the, anyway, you can read more about this on your own, but what emerged from the Resolutions Committee uh, especially after the rejection of the amendments, was a rather different beast from that which had originally been proposed by the original author. That in itself is part of the cause for the controversy. But the real reason for the controversy is not so much the process, although that does seem to have been flawed in some ways. It really is the substance, and that's what I want to talk to you about now. Now, I can't emphasize how important this is before we get into the details. This statement, unlike the other ones that I've talked about, does not come from this or that odd theologian or um, pastor or whatever. It comes from the convention itself. Through the resolution, just in the nature of the resolution, it seems to be speaking for everyone who was gathered, at least at that resolution. And though we all know technically it's supposed to be a statement only by those who are there, nevertheless, we know that in effect, it becomes over time, just about every resolution, a statement for the convention itself. And what that means is that your money being sent to the cooperative program is propagating now this kind of thing. And that's something I think we need to be very concerned about. Now, as Resolution 9 emerged from the committee and it was eventually adopted, it is something of a mixed bag with respect to critical race theory. That is, there's some statements in it that are cautionary, maybe even negative, about critical race theory. But there are some others that are positive. And it's those in combination with uh, the negative ones that create the problem. I'm not going to read the whole resolution for you. You can find it online if you don't already have a hard copy and read it for yourself. But I do want to give you some examples of the provisions in it that I think are good. Uh, that is, the ones that are cautionary or, or negative. Uh, here's one. 
Critical race theory and intersectionality alone are insufficient to diagnose and redress the root causes of the social ills that they identify, which result from sin. The implication is we need more than just these theories, and in context, the implication specifically is we need scripture and Christian theology. Another positive, uh, another statement that I, I think is a good one. Scripture contains categories and principles by which to deal with racism, poverty, sexism, injustice, and abuse that are not rooted in secular ideology. So the sum statement is being made about the, the significant uh, Scripture when it comes to assessing problems like racism. Humanity is primarily identified in Scripture as image bearers of God. This is a rejection of the critical race notion that our identity is primarily bound up in whichever societal identity group or groups we happen to be a part of. Here's another one that may be the most important of all. Critical race theory and intersectionality should be employed not as transcendental ideological frameworks. So there's a recognition that critical race theory, as we said before, is a worldview, and that as a worldview, it is problematic and, quote, should not be employed. Now, if these were the only statements that we found in the, in the resolution, I'd have no problem, and I don't think anybody else would either. But it's these other statements, uh, the statements that I'm about to give to you, that have a more positive assessment of critical race theory, at least for some purposes and to some extent, that are troubling, especially when you set them alongside the negative statements that we've just considered. First of all, in the resolution, you find a number of statements, and this is sort of pro-critical race theory, that describe critical race theory as, quote, analytical tools. Let me give you a couple of those. Critical race theory is a set of analytical tools that explain how race has and continues to function in society. And intersectionality is the study of how different personal characteristics overlap and inform one's experience. Here's another. Critical race theory and intersectionality alone are insufficient to diagnose and redress the root causes. I read that earlier, but here's how that, that phrase goes on. Yet these analytical tools, again, that expression, can aid in evaluating a variety of human experiences. Then you've got a number of statements, again on the pro side, that indicate that critical race theory supposedly provides valuable insights. Valuable insights for what? Well, for the study of um, social dynamics. That's the expression that's used. Let me read one of these for you. Evangelical scholars who affirm the authority and sufficiency of Scripture have employed selective insights from critical race theory and intersectionality to understand multifaceted social dynamics. Here's another one. General revelation accounts for truthful insights found in human ideas that do not explicitly emerge from Scripture and reflects what some may term common grace. The suggestion here is that critical race theory to the extent that it uh, results in truthful insights, and the implication is the authors of this believed it does, uh, they are in fact a part of what we would call common grace. Now if you take these statements all together, both the con statements and the pro statements, you see that two things are being affirmed. The first is that critical race theory has some genuine utility, at least as a, quote, tool for social analysis. And the second is, and this is subtler, but it is that it's possible to separate critical race theory as a worldview from critical race theory as a tool. Both of these claims I consider to be problematic. I'm going to start with the latter. Is it possible to separate critical race theory as a tool, in other words, the analysis of crystal, uh, uh, critical race theory, from critical race theory as a worldview? I'm skeptical. Uh, and to explain why I'm skeptical, I want to talk about something other than critical race theory for a moment. I want to talk about liberation theology. Now, I understand liberation theology and critical race theory are, uh, are different, different things, uh, but they are nevertheless branches off the same tree of neo-Marxism. To get to the point, the Roman Catholic Church faced the same kind of question with liberation theology that the Southern Baptist Convention and other evangelicals are now facing about critical race theory, and that is whether it is possible to separate the analytical tools that are supposedly within it from the larger worldview out of which those tools emerge, which in the case of liberation theology was something much closer to classical uh, Marxism than, than neo-Marxism. 
This question came to a head in the early 1980s when then Cardinal Ratzinger, later he would become Pope Benedict XVI, he was the head of the Congregation of the Doctrine for the Faith, that's the Roman Catholic Theological Watchdog uh, Agency, issued this uh, famous statement entitled, Instruction on Certain Aspects of the Theology of Liberation. Again, one of the issues that's tackled in this statement is, is it possible to separate the analytical stuff in Marxism from the worldview or the background ideological stuff? In short, the answer from Cardinal Ratzinger was no. Let me read a couple of excerpts from this instruction. In the case of Marxism, in the particular sense given to it in this context, a preliminary critique is all the more necessary since the thought of Marx is a global vision of reality that all data received form, observation, and analysis are brought together in a philosophical and ideological structure which predetermines the significance and importance to be attached to them. The ideological principles come prior to the study of the social reality and are presupposed in it. Thus, no separation of the parts of this epistemological unique, epistemologically unique complex is possible. If one tries to take only one part, say the analysis, one ends up having to accept the entire ideology. That is why it is not uncommon for the ideological aspects to be predominant among things which the theologians of liberation borrow from Marxist authors. The warning of Pope Paul VI remains valid, fully valid today. Marxism, as, as it is actually lived out, poses many distinct aspects and questions for Christians to reflect upon and act upon. However, it would be, quote, illusory and dangerous to ignore the intimate bond which radically unites them and to accept elements of Marxist analysis without recognizing its connections with the ideology and to enter into the practice of class struggle, et cetera, et cetera. There's much more in this instruction about the difficulty, if not the impossibility, of separating out the analysis from the underlying ideology. Now, maybe the analogy I'm drawing between liberation theology and critical legal theory here is, is a bit strained, but I don't think so, again, given that they're branches off the same tree. And then in both cases, what is being discussed is the possibility of somehow extracting the analytical tools from a Marxist-based theory and leaving the underlying worldview behind. I think if it can't be done with liberation theology, I, it can't be done with critical race theory. All right, so let me turn my attention now from liberation theology, which I consider to be the analogy, to critical race theory itself. And what I want us to do is to recall the respects in which the worldview of critical race theory is at odds with the Christian worldview. And then ask the question, how much of those elements of the worldview of critical race theory you can take away and still have something resembling critical race theory be present that you might be able to use in some sense as an analytical tool? So remember the comparison that we drew between Christianity and critical theory. Christianity, the worldview, tells us where we come from by saying we were created by a loving God. It tells us what our problem is by identifying sin, that is, the fall. It tells us what the solution of this problem is, which is redemption through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, God's Son. And then it tells us what the effect of that is, and with this, and gives us an indication of our ongoing purpose, which is restoration. Critical theory, on the other hand, remember, really has no answer to the question of creation because that's just not a problem for it. But when it gets to the other worldview questions, remember, it has very different answers from that which we saw from the Christian worldview. Uh, in lieu of saying that our fundamental problem is sin, rebellion, the fall, the fundamental problem is oppression. Patriarchy, white supremacy, uh, heteronormativity, toxic masculinity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, when it comes to the question of what the solution is, it's not redemption, it is instead political activism, protest, resistance. 
And when it comes to the question of what our ultimate destiny is, it's not restoration, but it is liberation. Those are the elements of the critical race theory worldview. If you take that away, what is left of the theory itself that might in some sense serve as an analytical tool? I think the answer is nothing. Now let me address the other uh, implicit um, claim that is made in this resolution. Remember the, the second one, that's the one that I dealt with first, is that it's possible to separate the critical race theory worldview from the critical race theory tools. The first one, which is the one I now want to talk about, the first claim that's being made, at least implicitly, is that critical race theory does have some utility as an analytical tool and one that yields valuable uh, insights. Neil Shinvey, to whom I've referred a number of times already, despite being uh, an ardent opponent of critical race theory as a whole, nevertheless believes that it may in fact have some utility, what he refers to as possible strengths. Um, I want to go through these one at a time, and then I want to come back and consider whether his points are well made. Here's the first strength that he says critical race theory has. The greatest strength of critical theory is its recognition that oppression is evil. Okay. Second, critical theory's focus on groups rather than on individuals provides insight into how laws and institutions can promote sin. Interesting examples he gives. Take chattel slavery in the U.S. or the Holocaust or apartheid in South Africa. Clearly these horrors shouldn't be exclusively understood as individual acts of immorality. In all of these examples, immorality was codified and written into law. The law then informed and shaped human moral intuitions, as it always does. Human beings were individually morally responsible for their actions, but Laws and institutions and systems dramatically amplify the effects of human wickedness. Third, he says, third strength of, of critical theory, hegemonic power does exist and it can have an insidious effect on our norms and values. Here's the example he gives, one that would appeal to us um, as social conservatives, most of us anyway. Here's an example that will resonate with conservatives. Think about how Hollywood and Madison Avenue define standards of beauty and sexuality. Think about how hard we have to work as Christian parents to teach our children that women are not sex objects and that real beauty is internal, not merely external. The way in which the entertainment and advertising industries shape how we understand human value is an example of hegemonic power with respect to beauty. Well, I have the utmost respect for Neil Shinvey uh, generally and for his uh, intellectual work in, in particular. Uh, but on this point, I, I have to break ranks with him because I don't think that any of the, the strengths that he's identified uh, are, to the extent that they're strengths at all, are uh, unique to critical race theory. In other words, I don't think we need critical race theory in order to get these strengths. Uh, but in some cases, I, I'm, I'm not sure that they're strengths at all. Let me explain. First of all, um, the suggestion that critical race theory provides a, the valuable insight that oppression is sin. I, I, I don't think we needed critical race theory to tell us that oppression is, uh, is sin. Uh, Christians have always regarded uh, oppression as sin, and so also did the Jews before them. We have hundreds and thousands of years of condemnation of oppression as sin before critical race theory was ever conceived of. So this supposed strength, I think, in some sense is illusory because we don't need critical race theory to tell us that oppression is sin. Second, uh, Neil Shinvey's point about what I'd call it structural sin, that is, that um, critical race theory helps us to see that, that sin is not simply an individual thing, uh, it can be a, a collective uh, thing. Well, the examples that Neil Shinvey gives are, are not the same as those of the critical race theory crowd. The examples he gave were laws and institutions, and then more specifically, Jim Crow, apartheid, and Holocaust. But these structures, if that's what you want to call them, they were overtly and forthrightly racist. They were racist by design. The people who set them up were intending to harm an oppressed group. Now, when critical race theory talks about structures, it has something very different in mind. 
it has in mind some structures, whatever they may be, that though they look benign on their face, nevertheless unconsciously and invisibly in some sense, and indeed without any active intention on the part of these supposed oppressors, nevertheless harm the oppressed. Another point, do we really need again critical race theory in order to help us understand that laws and institutions can, as uh, Mr. Shinvey says, shape moral intuitions and, quote, dramatically amplify the effects of individual human wickedness? Again, um, I think that this is something that we know quite independently of, um, of critical race theory. Is it not self-evident common sense? It, then Neil Shimmy's third point about hegemonic power. Well, again, I think the example is not particularly apt. Do we really need critical race theory? Um, the critical race theory and ultimately Gramscian concept of hegemonic power to see that Hollywood and Madison Avenue, to see what they're up to, to see how that shapes cultural values, and then to appreciate the difficulties that that presents for us as Christian parents in trying to see to the proper moral uh, formation of our children. Again, I don't think we need critical theory in order to do that. That should be sort of self-evident to anyone who has any sensibility uh, about how it is that various social groups uh, exercise influence over others. For these reasons, then, I have to break with, uh, with Neil Shinvey whenever it comes to an assessment of, a positive assessment of critical race theory. In responding to these suggestions that critical race theory is useful as an analytical tool and yields valuable insights, I want to do more than simply respond to the list of supposed strengths of critical race theory that uh, Neil Shinvey has, has uh, prepared. Um, I want to make some observations, in other words, uh, of my own. And first of all, what I want to ask is this. What does it really mean to use critical race theory as an analytical tool? I mean, what does that look like? Well, my best guess is what it looks like is we've got our theologian working in the seminary, say Southern, and he's collected these books that have been written by critical race theorists, and he's going through them, combing them for insights about whatever social moral problem it is he happens to be investigating. Well, if that's what it means, practically speaking, to use critical race theory as an analytical tool, I find that disturbing because we're talking about trying to extract insights out of scholarship that itself is shot through with the critical race theory worldview that importantly has, is based on an epistemology, lived experience, remember, that is at odds with the traditional Western uh, epistemology, one that values logic and rationality and evidence gathering and testing. How reliable can any insights that one might supposedly think one might find in such a work be, given the epistemological basis upon which the author is operating? And then remember the anti-objectivism. To the extent that we have theologians looking for information about moral truth, I should hope that they're looking for information about objective moral truth, but we're talking about their delving into works of scholarship in which that premise is rejected right at the beginning. Again, if this is what using critical race theory as an analytical tool means, I find the whole idea not just uh, problematic, but disturbing. Now let me talk about insights. If there is any insight that critical race theory supposedly is provided, this is what nearly everyone cites. It's, um, shall we say, an expanded uh, notion of structural or systemic racism. Another term for that is institutional uh, racism. And again, that's the idea that racism is not just uh, an individual thing resulting from active animus, uh, active desire to harm, but can also be a uh, systemic kind of thing that happens as a result of unjust social structures that somehow keep the oppressed down. I've always found this notion of systemic or structural racism, just like the underlying concept of unjust social structure, 
to be very nebulous and ill-defined. Instances of it are never named, much less described, and the mechanisms whereby these structures supposedly operate uh, to bring about the oppression of this or that group. That is the step-by-step -step causal sequence, starting with the supposed structure and ending up with the supposed adverse effect, is itself never specified. If anything, it's only assumed. This aspect of liberation theology bugged me even when I was still enamored of it. You read through book after book after book by the liberation theologians and you're told again and again that the reason that this or that group of workers is oppressed is because of some supposed unjust economic structures. But these structures are never identified, and it's never explained how it is that they actually operate causally to bring about um, the oppressive results. And so the impression that you get is that um, whatever these social structures are, they are these mysterious forces lurking in the background behind individual flesh and blood human actors that just as mysteriously bring about their pernicious social effects. It seems to me that what I've just said about liberation theology is equally true of critical race theory. Consider the examples that supposedly are cited by critical race theorists or those who seem to be on the same page. I want to give you a quote from Stokely Carmichael, whom you may remember was involved in the Black Power Movement, had something to do with the Black Panthers. Like the critical race theorist, he's not a critical race theorist himself, though he was a Marxist, uh, he had a notion of institutional or structural racism. And here are the examples that he offered. Quote, when white terrorists bomb a black church and kill five black children, that's an act of individual racism, widely deplored, deployed, uh, deplored by most segments of the society. But when in that same city, Birmingham, Alabama, 500 black babies die each year because of the lack of food, power, shelter, medical facilities, thousands more destroyed and maimed physically, emotionally, intellectually because of conditions of poverty and discrimination in the black community, that's a function of institutional racism. When a black family moves into a home in a white neighborhood and is stoned, burned, or routed out, they are victims of an overt act of individual racism, which most people will condemn. But it is institutional racism that keeps black people locked in dilapidated slum tenements, subject to the daily prey of exploitative slumlords, merchants, loan sharks, discriminatory real estate agents. The society either pretends it does not know of this latter situation or is, in fact, incapable of doing anything meaningful about it. Now, as I read through this list of examples, I don't see any examples of all, at least not of what I'm looking for. And that is examples of structures, institutions, whatever the word you might want to use, that actually are supposed to be responsible for these unfortunate and undesirable effects that are listed. What I see is a listing of disparate, negative disparate effects on blacks as compared with whites, accompanied by an assumption that there must be something going on behind the scenes at some supposed structural level, whatever that means, that is bringing about these results. I suppose it's possible that there might be some uh, occult social structures out there that are responsible for the disparate effects that were listed by Carmichael, which are the same uh, disparate effects that are cited by critical race theorists as supposed evidence of these uh, supposed structures. I suppose they, they might exist and they might uh, account for these effects at least to some degree. But isn't there an alternative explanation that perhaps is even simpler? What I have in mind is an explanation that's been offered by Thomas Sowell, among others. It's an explanation that he calls, this is his term, cultural. And what he suggests is that, uh, at least within our country, and indeed in, in many countries, uh, you see that as you go from one racial group to another, you encounter different subcultures to some degree, meaning different norms, different values, different practices. And his assertion further is that um, some of these sets of norms and values and practices are better at achieving certain results, uh, social results, than are uh, other sets of norms, values, and, um, and patterns of behavior. 
So the, the question that I would ask, again drawing heavily upon Soul's work, is if we might not have an alternative explanation of these disparate effects in elements of the black subculture that, I don't know what word you want to use, are, are problematic, that are uh, to some degree undermining the success of persons who are a part of the subculture and who don't uh, break with it. The example that I mentioned earlier, which you recall I drew from Vody Bauckham, is the distressingly high rate of uh, single parent families within the black community. In other words, the problem of fatherlessness. Well, what is the cause of that? There have been suggestions by critical race theorists that maybe this too is, is an effect of some structural cause, but isn't the more obvious explanation that it is simply the result of, of um, behavior, uh, a pattern of behavior with respect to um, sex outside of wedlock that it itself reflects a cultural pattern and in turn one that we can trace ultimately to the sexual revolution that uh, took place starting in the late 1950s and really getting underway uh, in, in the 60s. Again, that's what I mean and that's what soul means by uh, a cultural uh, type problem. Let me take another example that is sometimes offered up by critical race theorists and their allies of the evidence of structural racism. And that is the fact that uh, on the whole, on average, uh, blacks, when they want to borrow money from banks, home mortgage loans in particular, end up being allowed to borrow less money and or have to pay higher interest rates. There was a time in which banks in the country would actually redline the uh, parts of the city uh, in which um, uh, properties that were considered to be risky collateral for home mortgage loans uh, were surrounded. And those parts of the cities tended to be uh, predominantly non-white instead of white. The practice was called uh, redlining. And so the suggestion is that there's some structural problem going on that results in um, African Americans getting the short end of the stick when it comes to the cost and availability of credit. Well, I, again, I suppose that's, that's possible, but isn't there another explanation that's a little bit more straightforward? And isn't it that you know, there are reasons for this? That's itself a separate question, but typically the black applicant for the home mortgage loan has a lower amount of wealth and a lower income than does the correlative white applicant for the home mortgage loan. Is it not entirely to be expected that a banker under such circumstances would consider the black applicant to be a greater risk that is than the white one because there's, uh, there's less financial wherewithal to guarantee repayment of the loan? It seems to me that in a case like this, a banker, uh, you can describe his behavior using a, a word that starts with R, but it's not racist. It seems to me that he's simply being rational. There's no need to posit some underlying structure to explain this disparate effect. The disparate effect is easily enough understandable if un one appreciates the economic reality of the situation. So just to sum up here, I find the whole idea that there are these uh, occult, uh, unjust structures out there in society that somehow bring about systematic or structural or institutional uh, racism to be itself a very problematic idea. It causes me to be skeptical of whether there really is any such thing that corresponds to these supposed concepts. And once again, that this, this supposed insight that there is structural racism and these are the different ways in which it manifests itself is supposed to be the key insight of critical race theory. Well, if that's the key insight, then it seems to me that the, there are not very many insights to be had. These then are my objections to Resolution 9 and, and to the, more specifically, to the claims that are embedded in uh, Resolution 9, namely that it's possible to separate the, the worldview from the tools and then also that 
the tools do have, do have some real utility. Now there are some who, uh, in response to arguments uh, such as I've made here, have uh, objected that uh, it's in fact scriptural and in, indeed uh, consistent with uh, church history for Christians to look at the works of secular uh, philosophers and other thinkers with a view to uh, mining them for whatever might be true and, and valuable. Uh, one example that's given is of the Apostle Paul in his address uh, on Mars Hill in Athens. Um, then uh, another um, instance, this one in church history that's often cited, is uh, Augustine's answer to Tertullian. Tertullian said, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Well, um, Augustine's answer was we ought to go ahead and, and mine um, uh, the, the treasures of, of the Egyptians for all the silver and gold that we can get out of them, speaking metaphorically, of course, uh, of the Egyptian treasure as being, again, the works of, of uh, secular thinkers. And then there's this phrase that's become very popular uh, among those who are involved in this discussion of a critical race theory now, which is uh, all truth is, is God's truth. Well, I, I certainly don't deny uh, uh, any of of what I've just related by way of uh, trying to summarize the objection, but I think the objection is misplaced. And to start with the Apostle Paul, uh, when the Apostle Paul turned to these pagan philosophers, what he drew from them could in fact be said to be true, at least in this limited sense that they were referring to Jesus. And the important thing to recognize is there was some truth in the works of these philosophers. But as I've tried to explain, in critical race theory, I just don't see any truth there, at least no truth in terms of insights that could not be gotten from other sources. So what I'd say with respect to critical race theory is, uh, though yes, all truth is God's truth, well, critical race theory is not true. And with respect to plundering the Egyptians, there's really nothing here worth plundering to the extent that critical race theory could be considered gold at all. It would have to be called fool's gold.